Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Good to have you with us on another Wednesday afternoon forum. Uh, I am Matt Barnes, morning co-anchor at NBC4 today. Also a very proud member of the Board of Trustees for CMC. Oh, that's not necessary. I'm not important here today. And speaking of sponsors, we have a few here we want to recognize as a sponsor of CMC's Optimal Health Series, the Ohio State University Wexler Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital. Thank you so much. And then the sponsors of today's forum, specifically Cardinal Health, Mount Carmel Health System, and Ohio Health, and to our partner, the Franklin County Board of Commissioners. Thank you all so much for being a sponsor today. And as always, we're grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream, which is being carried on CMC's social media platforms. So let's thank all of our sponsors one more time for supporting today's sold out forum. How about that? That's right, you all got in before we sold out, so you are really lucky to be here. Um, we often tackle serious subjects here at CMC, and as Sophia mentioned earlier, no subject may be more important than today's. In Franklin County and across the United States, there are long-standing racial disparities in maternal and birth outcomes, but particularly between white and black women. As highlighted in the award-winning 2022 documentary film, Aftershock, black mothers face three to four times the mortality risk compared to their white counterparts. So today we will focus in on this hidden epidemic in maternal health and highlight a way toward better and more equitable outcomes for all mothers. I'm excited to welcome today's esteemed speakers, Jatu Boykai, Maternity Services Nurse Manager with Mount Carmel Health System. We have Shawnee Benton Gibson, the co-founder and CEO of Spirit of a Woman Leadership Development Institute and the co-founder of the ARIA Foundation. <laughs> I told you they're distinguished. They have more than one title here. Um, Jessica Roach, CEO and co-founder of Restoring Our Own Through Transformation, also known as Root. And Dorian Wingard, co-founder and chief operations officer of Root. And it's an honor to have as our hosts for this discussion, uh, Franklin County Board of Commissioner Erica Crawley, who will be up here in a second. To read more about today's panelists, again, and their complete bios, scan that QR code on the cards at your table. For now, please welcome Commissioner Crawley to the podium to start our discussion. Good afternoon. Thank you, Matt, for that introduction. Thank you all for being here today, uh, whether you're in person or online. Um, it is uh, an honor to be with you today and to lift up and continue to raise awareness about a subject that really isn't hidden. Um, even though Matt said it's hidden, I think it might be hidden for some of us in the, the community and um, a different demographics, but especially for women of color or in particular black women and brown women, it's not a hidden issue. It is very much at the forefront of our minds. And so um, before we get into the panel, I just want to frame this conversation about um, how we even got here today. And so again, thank you to our host CMC for being willing to ha have this conversation as uh, my colleagues and I brought this um, to CMC to raise awareness. And then, as you know, later on this afternoon, we have a partnership with COSI. Um, so I came to the board in 2021, but previous to me coming to the board in 2020, Franklin County Board of Commissioners declared racism as a public health crisis. And in doing so, we understood that one of the issues that was facing our community was maternal and infant mortality. Um, that black and brown uh, women or birthing people go into a healthcare system that doesn't treat everyone fairly and equitably and wanted to put some real tangible solutions on the table to see how we can address it from a local perspective given that the legislature had not moved. And I was in the legislature at the time, which is one of the reasons why I resigned from being a state representative to come to the county. Um, as a commissioner, I ran for office um, to go to the, to the state uh, to talk about my own ex lived experience um, with 
having a traumatic pregnancy with my twins uh, 19 years ago and then experiencing complications right after about a week and a half later where I could have lost my life. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And so I wanted to join a board that was already putting this at the forefront um, and that my voice could just be added value to move the county forward and to save lives. And so last year, um, at the National Association of Counties, as um, we have presented a resolution to the federal government to invest in this space, my colleague, Commissioner John O'Grady, was the chair of LUC, the Large Urban County Caucus, and one of his priorities was to lift up um, infant mortality and to address it on the national level. And so I was asked to sit on a panel at LUC with the director of the documentary Aftershock and, and another community leader to talk about my own lived experience, but at what it looks like as a policymaker to lead in this space. And so when we were at LUC in Chicago, my administrator, Administrator Wilson, was like, we have to have community conversations and uh, view the documentary Aftershock and then talk about what we can do as a community, as a collective, to save lives. And so this this is the beginning of that effort. And so I just want to say thank you to my administrator, thank you to Public Affairs for, for taking this on and making sure that what the, co the commissioners wanted to see in the community came to fruition, so thank you. So um, when I, as I turn it over to my panelists, if you could, I, I know Matt already did a quick introduction, but if you would be willing to talk about or just share briefly how you come into this space, what you bring to this uh, conversation, and how you got um, into this work. So I'll start with you, Shani. Right. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everyone. I know you just ate lunch, many of you, but we're all still here breathing, and I see your eyeballs looking, so I know you're here. So greetings, everyone. Greetings. Thank you, family. So my name is Shani um, Benton Gibson, and um, how I landed in this space, this work, is by divine orchestration and calling. Um, I know that this is purpose work, and even though it can be quite painful navigating, especially with the recent loss of my daughter, Shamani Makiba Gibson, I tell everyone that um, I can grieve and lead at the same time. And if I res resisted or released my purpose work after my daughter passed away, she would have come for me energetically and as an ancestor. Mm -hmm. So I am here hoping and trusting that you all will take the information about Shimani's story and Amber Isaac's story and carry that out into the work in the world so that we can make a difference. Um, I have a company, Spirit of a Woman, so it kind of tells you what my focus is. Um, I do rites of passage programming and all, and started off working with young girls um, between the ages of 12 to 16 and celebrating their menstrual flow and their womanhood and preparing them for life and looking at their sexual and reproductive health and wanting them to look at that closely across their lifespan. And in, as part of that work, um, started to focus in on reproductive health and reproductive justice. So my story did not begin with a death. It began with the lives of young women. And so I look forward to the conversation and you learning more about me. And I wanna quickly say um, that I want to acknowledge the First Nation, Native American people that are part of this this city that you live in, the Lenape people, the Miami people, the Ottawa people, Wyandotte, is that the pr proper yes, pronunciation? Yes. Um, and there's another Seneca people. Mm -hmm. Just the unceded lands that we sit, work, play, um, folks who died unceremoniously. I try my best when I'm in spaces and I have the privilege to lead and speak, to acknowledge them and to celebrate them and to remember them, that they're connected to everything that we do because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for what they did before we got here. So thank you all. Good morning, my name is Jatu Boykai. Um, I've been a nurse for about 12 years and I am currently the nurse manager um, of labor and delivery and mother infant at Mount Carmel Grove City. And um, how I have um, come into this space or entered this space is um, through professional but also personal um, experience. I, I have three kids, most recently um, my 14 month old up there. <laughs> Little. <laughs> <laughs> That's my baby. <laughs> and, you know, with every pregnancy that I've had, um, you know, just knowing the statistics that are out there, I've been terrified to um, 
to be pregnant. And so, you know, being a labor and delivery nurse and, and knowing the statistics, it's, it's getting harder and harder to, you know, as a member of the healthcare field, um, it's, it's getting harder and harder to say that I am proud to be a member of the healthcare field with what is happening and, and, and how we're failing black women. Um, because a failure to black women is, is a failure to humanity. Because if there's one thing that, there's one word that I can use to describe black women, if I was only allowed to use one word, it's humanity. Um, and the fact that we are failing black women on the level that we are, um, it, I, I'm no longer able to just sit back and say, you know, I'm a nurse. I'm proud to be a nurse. I, I, without doing something about it, I can't. I, I can't. I can't just sit back and not do anything. So that's why um, I'm here, and 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 that's why I continue to have these conversations, and I'm going to continue to have these conversations until I don't have to have them anymore. That's right. Jessica. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Roach. Um, how I have come into this work is um, I come from a line of black midwives and also am a nurse and a public health professional. Um, I also have my own personal experience that I have endured after I became a, a professional and becoming a nurse, um, not only as a mother and experiencing it personally with one of my own births, but then again as a grandmother and watching one of my children go through what was a near miss in her own birth experience. Um, so the reason that we are here is because we know that we have the ability and the innovation and the knowledge to be able to care for our families, and we know what it is that needs to be done in order to be able to, to mitigate and in certain, certain circumstances eliminate um, the issues that we are faced with as black families. Um, because we know what that impact is and how that affects not only um, the mother and the child, but the siblings, the father, and the multi-generations that come from that. And so um, that's a little bit about why it is that we're here and why it is that we do the work and why we're dedicated to this. Dorian. Hi. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's always a good question because I, I don't know how to answer it. Um, my background has always been in the juxtaposition of criminal justice policy, human services policy, and education policy. And even with that base in place, when Jessica um, uh, called and, and wanted to talk about this, uh, I did not know that the issue was as bad as it is. Uh, it, it's not hidden, to Commissioner Crawley's point, uh, it's never been hidden. We always have known uh, that there has been a disproportionate impact upon black families with regard to anything that happens in this country. So this is just this is just one part of a whole canon of issues that black families face in black communities across the country. But when we had our conversation about it, it became clear that the providence that led us to that conversation required that we do what we do the way that we do it. So we contextualize our work in black family because that's what it's about. And as we do that, we understand the need to help to re-empower community in that way. But the epidemic of black infant and maternal mortality is real, it's obvious, it's all throughout this city even if the city doesn't act like it is. It is, we see it every day, we deal with it every day. So the motivation um, to, to be in this work was not necessarily uh, something that I think we voluntarily did. Um, it, it was revealed that we needed to do it in the most unapologetic way that we can do it, and that's what we've done. Thank you. So before I ask my next question, let me provide you all with um, some data and statistics. That's how I always um, come to work, is with um, facts and figures. And so in 2021, some of the most recent data says that um, 
Over 1,200 women died of maternal causes in the United States compared to 861 in 2020 and 754 in 2019. So in 2020, we saw a 40% increase and between 2019 and 2021, we saw a 60% increase in deaths. The maternal mortality rate for 2021 was 32.9 deaths per 100,000 live births compared to, with a rate of 23.8 in 2020 and 20.1 in 2019. In 2021, for non-Hispanic black women, the maternal death rate was 69.9 deaths per 100,000 live births, 2.6 times the rate of non-Hispanic white women, which is only 26.6%. In Ohio, um, in the most recent data, which is outdated, um, which is insufficient and everybody should be angry about that because we need the data to understand the direct and indirect causes. But in the most recent data, we knew that black women made up 17% of the births, um, but made up 34% of the deaths. And out of all pregnancy-related deaths, no matter what the race was, 57% were deemed to be preventable. Just yesterday, the CDC reported that about one in five women were mistreated while receiving maternity care, and nearly a third faced discrimination, according to the CDC. 30% of black and Hispanic mothers reported mistreatment, and 40% reported discrimination. Uh, of the 2,400 women that were surveyed, they talked about how they were ignored, providers ignored them, they're, they were refused requests uh, for help or it took un, an unreasonable amount of time to respond to their requests for help. Nearly 7% of women, uh, one in 15, said that they were shouted at or scolded by doctors. And nearly 4% were threatened by their health care providers. Um, and I can go on and on. So you can Google the most recent report from the CDC. And so as I turn to my panelists, um, and I'll start with you, Shawnee, if, if you don't mind speaking about your experience with your daughter um, and what happened that surround her uh, untimely death. Sure. Um, I'm curious about the space and who's actually seen Aftershock, the documentary. And this is not me taking notes and judging you. It's just to get a gauge on what you know and what you don't know. So if you could raise your hand if you've seen the documentary already. Thank you so much. Um, so for those of you who have seen it, this will serve as a reminder. Um, and for those of you who are not, just to catch you up to um, the story and what has me be here now. Um, so my daughter, Shimani, um, was 30 years old when she decided that she wanted to have her second child. Um, she already had um, my granddaughter, Anari, and she had experienced a C-section. And she wanted to have a different experience. She had a midwife and a doula um, for Anari's um, birth, but she wasn't satisfied with how the hospital navigated with her and how she felt like she was coerced into getting a C, or scared into getting a C-section. So she decided she wanted to have a natural birth, um, home birth, and started to move in that direction. Had a black midwife, because in, in the first birthing experience, she had a, white, a set of white, a collective of white uh, midwives. And she was also disturbed about the rotation of the midwives that were working with her. So she did that. My daughter was a dancer. She was an entrepreneur, two-time entrepreneur, had two businesses with her partner, um, took very good care of her body, read ferociously um, information about a lot of things, but definitely her birthing journey, very vocal. Um, when she went into labor at her home, um, it abruptly stopped, and she inquired about what to do with her midwife and was told that if her labor didn't start up again, that she should go to the hospital, and she did. Now, I've been in the field and the work a long time, so I called my friend who was the head of labor and delivery at the hospital and told her that we were coming. And they prepared for us and they welcomed us. And that's a privilege. I want to let y'all know. Black folk I get privileges, too. So I had that privilege and just part of a community that knew me well. And she went. We were there for like two days, and she wasn't progressing. So she got a chance to choose to move in the direction of a C-section. Had the C-section, baby came. Um, I won't get into the details, because there's some things that we're working through. Um, but bring baby home, she started to have some symptoms, uh, difficulty breathing, um, 
went down to get the mail one day and couldn't get back up the stairs. And so in my mind, I'm like, this sounds like a pulmonary embolism. But she was like, no, Ma, they checked me. They told me where I'm clear for that. When she went back to get her staples removed, she told them about the symptoms. They're like, oh, you're probably just doing too much. You need to rest. She had a pulmonary embolism. So the worst thing you can say is lay down. Um, right, so she was told that our family rallied, we made food, we did all the things, and then we, um, I went to visit her and we had some other family members there, and she went into medical distress. So I watched my daughter smiling, happy, she was a foodie, who the other foodies in here? Eating food, talking, laughing, oh, you're a foodie too? And um, then all of a sudden it shifted, and she went into shock and we went into action to address it. I won't get into all the details because we want to hear from the other panelists, but my daughter died within 15 hours of that first experience of the crisis. And she was taken to a hospital that was divested from, because it was the closest hospital, but the hospital she gave birth in was only five more blocks away from that hospital. So I definitely want to talk about how the system failed her. Because my daughter had a lot of knowledge, but the system didn't meet her at her knowledge. And that happens a lot with people. And I also want to say that my daughter, just like Beyonce and Serena, like my daughter knew things, had covering, but there are a lot of women, black and brown women, who don't have all of that. Some who are substance abusers or have other issues, mental health, homeless, and they all should be treated the same, no matter what. Thank you for that. Um, and I will go to Jatu to talk about equity, the barriers to equity and systems change um, that you see in, in your field and, and where you work. Um, but I appreciate you um, setting, teeing that question up for Jatu because um, for me, when I went to the hospital experiencing complications, um, I was talking about how I was having extreme pain. I, and I just sat there for eight to 10 hours in the emergency room for them to say, you know, you're collecting blood in your pelvis, go home, take some over-the-counter medicine, you'll be okay. It'll dissipate over time, right? And so, you know, similar to your daughter, that's hemorrhaging, right? And that's how people die. And they just say, go home, lay down, take some over-the-counter medicine. And so as you are a nurse and you are seeing people who look like me and Shani's daughter um, and trying to change this in this field, what barriers do you see in your work um, to equity and, and, and systems change to, to be able to make a difference? Um, well, obviously, the biggest barriers is there's just not enough of us at the bedside. Um, and, you know, I, when I, I told Shawnee I couldn't watch the movie when it first premiered because I was pregnant and I just didn't want to traumatize myself like that. So I recently watched the movie. And after I watched it, one of the most impactful parts for me was um, the, there was, there's a midwife in New York that they interviewed. And she was talking about um, the history of midwifery and how it was essentially, it started as, you know, black slave women delivering all the babies, oops, sorry, all the babies, and, and how that was, it was deemed to um, be, black women had too much control because they had, um, they, they knew the ins and outs of these women's bodies, and that was way too much control to, to, to have, so we're gonna take that away. And when that was taken away, we, we gradually went from, that to OBGYN care that we see today, where we were delivering babies at home to now delivering babies in the hospital. And if I've never had a panic attack before, I had a panic attack that night after watching that part because I was like, well, I'm, I'm a part of this. <laughs> and so, you know, after watching that, you know, I, I feel like my purpose in the hospital has changed and now I feel like I'm here to stand watch for these women. And I have stories, you know, I. I one, one story specifically, um, uh, I, there was a patient who came back in postpartum with blood pressures in the 170s, and um, she was crying and wanted to go home because she had a newborn at home. Fine, understandable. And they were getting ready to send her home with blood pressures in the 170s mm -hmm. over 100s. And, you know, I saw the resident going with the AMA form to send her home and I look up at the screen and I see the blood pressure and I said, wait right here. I went in, sat down beside her face to face. She's crying, I'm crying. <laughs> and I'm like, you can't go home, not on my watch. 
I will not allow you to go home and become another statistic and come back here with a stroke or worse. You are looking at 24 hours with your baby. I'm looking at a lifetime. Please yes. just stay. Sure. And she stayed. And, it, and I hate to think that way, but you have to. I wonder if they would have fought for her mm -hmm. like I did yeah. um, if she was a different color. And, it, and it, makes, it makes me really sad. So that's why my goal, my mission, has been since I started, because I was the only black nurse on my unit, on the unit that I managed when I first started. I've hired, and I'm, yes, I'm counting, I have, I've, I've hired 20 black people <laughs> in the past three years. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm continuing that. Um, my, my mission is to bring black nurses back to the bedside because yeah. we have to stand watch for each other. We have to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you for that. We know, I mean, statistics show that when um, women of color or black women have um, healthcare providers that look like them, whether it's an OBGYN, a nurse, midwife, or doula, that birth outcomes increase and positively, significantly. So that's real. So thank you for all the hiring that you're doing on this space. Um, so I'll go to Jessica and Dorian, and same question, but um, if you can come from a, a different perspective, just because one, Jessica, you're a practitioner in the space, but you also lead an organization, right, that requires funding to continue to do this work. And so for Jessica and Dorian, what are the barriers to equity and systems change that you are seeing from a practitioner perspective, but also a leader of an organization? Quickly, so I know. I know, and we'll talk about it later too after the documentary, but you come from a different perspective. So some of the barriers that, um, this is a, a difficult question to answer in, in that way, um, because there's, there's a significant amount of issues when it comes to um, being able to receive funding, especially when you are considered, quote unquote, a community-based organization, even though that's where really the work is because we are part of the community and that's part of the story that gets lost. You can say that you're a community-based organization, but if you don't have people within your organization that are actually of the community, you're not. You're simply using a title. And so for us, it becomes challenging because one, um, there's all, there is still this chasm when it comes to what our PWIs are those institutions that are considered to be the experts um, and them receiving the funding and then them being charged with the responsibility of saying, well, we'll give you this funding, but you have to, sit, you have to be able to work with these community-based organizations. But that's where it stops in most of those places. So the, the onus and the responsibility is left upon the funder to decide who it is that they're going to partner with. And when you have organizations like ours that are very, very outspoken and very clear about what the issues are and the true definition of equity, don't look at me like that, I'm trying to be serious. Uh, but, it's, but it's very real because when you have organizations like ours that are very specific and very unapologetic and are very clear about what is needed, our organizations will often get passed over so that you can work with other organizations that will be a little bit more amenable and maybe not as quote unquote aggressive. I'm sure that we've all heard that in the room at some point, just simply advocating for yourself makes you aggressive. And so it becomes a challenge because the people that are doing the work deserve fair and equitable pay, and we throw those terms around, but it has to actually be acknowledged. If we're, can't, if we're charged with taking care of our families in this way, we have to make sure that our folks and our employees and our staff are taken care of as well. It's one of the other issues that comes up, and when we talk about fair and equitable treatment in regards to funding, and then I'll stop, um, is that it's not ever considered and it's not part of the explanation or understanding of the work that we do, is that we are charged with having to fill the gaps. It's not something that we necessarily asked for, but it is something that we have to step into because we know that this is not just a linear issue. It requires looking at it from a 360 degree angle. So even if we have families that were able to access applications for resources or they get approval for resources, there's often gaps that happen that will leave our families very vulnerable. And so we have to fill those, but they're not technically a line item for us. That's right. And so it's this ongoing issue with not respecting and valuing the work that community-based organizations and as a practitioner, what I see and what we know that has to, all the things that have to be addressed because it can't just be about 
somebody's blood pressure. It's about what's happening at home and how are they going to be managed, and you know that, right? It also has to be about trying to protect the practitioners that are on the floor that are just the onlys and making sure that they're protected while they're trying to advocate, while they're trying to take care of our families, and then also being really clear that you can't just, um, you can't provide favoritism. Everybody deserves that same care. And you have to have the funding in order to be able to step into those spaces to provide the advocacy, the health care, the policy, the work. All I'll do is add to that. Uh, systemic and institutional racism is real. It's real. It permeates every structure, every system that we have in the state and in this country. So let's start there, because I have difficulty talking with people who don't get that. Secondly, obstetric racism is real. There's not one hospital system in this city that doesn't practice it. Not one. Not one is exempt. And after that, funding inequity is a major issue in this city. Jessica just spoke to that. It's very difficult to address the equity conversation or question if folks aren't invested in really doing it. Because if you're really having an equity conversation, your bank account looks different. What type of jobs you have access to look different. Where you live looks different. The type of care you get looks different if we're really having an equitable conversation. Unfortunately, a lot of systems don't really want to have that conversation. They want to do implicit bias training and then check the box and move on, which we refuse to do because it doesn't work. They want to just do a little information session or a lunch and learn or do these other types of things as if they're effective. They're not. I can't legislate morality. I can't change policy to, or to take ethics. I can't do anything to compel a person to be human. That's not what we can do. But what we can do is address the issue in the way that we're addressing it, call it out every time we see it. Jessica mentioned it. Root is an organization that, that has been able since 2017 to maintain a 0% infant mortality rate and a 0% maternal mortality rate. Okay? There's a reason why, and we don't know what it is, but there's a reason why most folks in this room don't know that. We don't understand what that reason is, but there's a reason for it. Either way, as you talk through the equity conversation, a lot of these systems institutions, they're not broken, they're working perfectly fine. They were designed to do exactly what they're doing. And as we, we as an organization who are not politically leveraged at all, and we design the organization on purpose that way, we're not financially leveraged at all. So we're able to be that voice that disrupts the conversation a lot of times in these spaces. But the point here is, if we're really focused on addressing these issues, all it takes is for us to just stand up and say, we're going to fix it. That's it. And I see a lot of friendly faces in the audience who know what is high joy, who know exactly what it is we're talking about and, and how does we, 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 we move in this situation. I, I see my friend Dr. Malello out there who is also uh, a partner of Root with our work with Ohio Health. He gets it. I'm putting you on front street, Jason, so you better stay with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, for us, it's really about understanding these structures, these systems, navigating them in a way that helps to re-empower and protect the families that we serve. So I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. Um, and, and, and I have one more question. Um, and so if you can, I'm going to go to you, Dorian, um, and if you could make it really brief so we can get to audience uh, questions um, in the live stream. Um, and, and, and Shawna, you might be able, you can speak to this as well. I think one thing that we miss in this conversation uh, when we talk about maternal mortality and morbidity, um, we always have women um, at, the, at the table in the conversations, and I think often men are left out. Um, so if you could speak to where, because we have men in the room, how they can play a bigger role, um, because if there is a death, ultimately sometimes a spouse, partner, grandmother, um, or husband is left. Um, well, the trauma. Thank you for that question, Commissioner Crawley. Um, the, 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 the brief answer is this. We are a part of the conversation, regardless of if folks want us to be or not. We're a part of the conversation. Uh, in most, more cases than not, it takes us to actually help you get there. So at some point, we got to have that part of that conversation, too. Uh, but it's difficult in the space because a lot of times we're pushed to be in a little bit of a box. Uh, we're not that. 
we're not that at all. As, as men, um, we have to stand up and acknowledge our role, be it in, con in a complicit nature or in a supportive nature. We have to acknowledge exactly what our role is in this process. Uh, we make sure that we do everything in balance as you see us here in, this, in, in, in this, this space. And we think that it is important that fathers are included at every step of the way, engaged by medical practitioners, engaged by any of the other support organizations that are involved, engaged at every step. More often than not, we are more active than you think we are. I, the CDC did a study on that, exactly. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I feel like if, well, I think we're at a point that if, if we are going to talk about the broken families that are created by state-sanctioned slavery, AKA incarceration, mass incarceration, we now have to start discussing the broken families that are created by maternal deaths because we're doing that too. Yes, and I, were you completing? Okay, I wanna make sure. Um, so if you've seen the film, you know that there's a bromance in the film, right? I'm, I'm so deliberate about the words. My son-in-law, my son-in-love, Omari Maynard, and Bruce McIntyre, who both lost their partners, um, are in the film, and you see black love coming from men toward one another, and you see men who are committed to their partners, very present for the birthing experience, present at the appointment, asking questions, doing research, being engaged, shedding tears for the loss, sharing, shedding tears for their children who no longer have their moms available to touch, feel, connect, co-create with their children and the, um, the partnership. So this is a big piece for the ARIA Foundation. This is a big piece for my life. Um, one of the things that I talk about a lot is the triplets. And some of you have seen me speak before, you may know what I'm about to say. White supremacy culture, patriarchy slash misogyny, and capitalism are killing us. All of us, but black and brown folks in particular. And so I want men in the conversation, I speak to Bruce and Omari and all the men that will listen about this, but we have to decolonize how we view partnership, how we view men, the gender roles. For me, it's about the energy and vib vibration of masculine and feminine. We have to relearn what it is to be with one another. And I'm anti-racist by being, not by title. I'm anti-patriarchal by being, not by title. I have to decolonize my mind and how I show up as a patriarch, as a white supremacist, as a capitalist in spaces, because I've been taught that. I'm 54, soon to be 55, and I've been indoctrinated to um, celebrate titles and um, authority and experience and what the world says is competence. So we definitely need men in the conversation, but we need men who are willing to do the work around how patriarchy and misogyny impact how they even show up in birthing spaces with women. I'll say this really quickly. My former partner was upset because I couldn't breastfeed our son. He didn't get that you just don't whip it out and pop presto, it just happens, right? But he was indoctrinated to think he knew better than me and my black womanness about my body and what it could do and what it couldn't do. And I don't, I'm not angry at him, I'm sad about society that made him think that. No, that was good. Uh, so we are going to move to questions from our live stream and in person um, audiences in, in just a few minutes. So if you have any questions, please make your way to the microphone now. Um, if you are watching online, please type your questions into chat. And before we take audience questions, um, well, I already asked my last one. So I'm gonna move to Lainey so we can have more time for um, the audience, who will be, um, Lainey is with CMC, and she is curating the questions from today's live stream audience. Um, and so if you're here in person and you have questions, move to the microphone where Lainey is. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Crawley. Whoops, I'm a little too close, I guess. Um, what Hello? Okay. What specific policies from the city or the state house are needed to address the disparity in maternal health care outcomes? <laughs> Okay, 
so we, we uh, Dorian and Jessica, if you want to speak briefly to the work that, very briefly to the work that um, we have done at the State House. But then I also want to talk to Jatu from a you know, practitioner perspective, what would you like to see as well? Policies need to be created in order to address the black maternal and infant mortality issue. Um, the policies that need to be created actually need to be honest and speak to humanity, um, per what my partner just discussed. You can create a policy. You can say we're going to fund this initiative and this issue. You can say that you're going to fund a task force. But the problem, again, is that there isn't any accountability on the other side to be able to say that that, those, that, that is actually working, that, there, that you have to have a structure that says you have these measurables. Because if you're asking for outcomes, then you have to have measurables that say that it actually works. <clears throat> Policies have to be created that very specifically state funding and programs need to be spearheaded and go to those organizations that have proven and shown that they are able to do the work to address the concern and the issue. And unfortunately, you're not always going to see that because it takes too long to be able to get out of the loop. You have to have a much stronger accountability factor and something that's going to turn it very quickly. Um, I'm going to leave the rest of this to you because well, you, I, 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 yeah, pray for me. The 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 type of, of policies from the state and and even local levels that need to to be passed are reflective of everything. Should be reflective of everything Jessica just said. Recently, we just saw that a Medicaid doula reimbursement bill was passed at the state house, um, and and while while we were um, were, were advocates of that being done. Uh, the bill that originated through Representative Crawley uh, was not the same bill that got passed. So the types of things that, that need to be legislated through policy include funding equity, should include funding equity, should include uh, more uh, direct engagements from state departments and offices to community based organizations and not do pass-throughs as they have been doing, where monies do not get to the community organizations that provide the services. So we're, we're talking about fairness, we're talking about equity, we're talking about access, we're talking about structuring policies or legislation that actually support the families that need the resources, not legislation that or policy that supports the political agendas of the folks who are ambitious enough to want to do extra things after the state house. So you, we have to be very honest about uh, what that looks like. And even from the federal level, uh, we, we do a lot of work with, with Vice President Harris's office and with Senator Underwood's office <clears throat> out of Illinois. And we have said to them consistently that federal policy, federal funding does not get to where it's supposed to be. It gets stuck somewhere around the state and the county levels, or the state and the organizational levels, and it doesn't get to where it needs to be. So we have to be able to generate a way to be accountable for those resources in the way that make the most sense. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Jatu? Um, I'm gonna talk more about perinatal care, and I think it'll tie into policy as I go. Um, but the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? That, I think, is perinatal care in the United States in a nutshell. We've been doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result. And what I think needs to happen is that we need a complete overhaul. Um, we need to incorporate doula services and uh, perinatal support services in a way that we have not done so in the past. It needs to be, here's your doctor, here's your doula. It needs to be <laughs> like a symbiotic relationship, and that needs to be the new model of care. Um, it, it's, it's the only way, in my opinion. Real, real, real quick, and it's not cheap. You can't fix it on the cheap. This is not cheap. It, and, and that's a lot of times what policy makers uh, try to do in terms of mitigating fiscal impact. It, it, but this is not a cheap fix. And we, also need to, we, we also need to expand the perinatal period. Yes. Yes. One year. One year postpartum is yes. what we're looking at. Even further. Honestly, mm -hmm. I have a 14-month-old, and sometimes I'm like, am I still at risk? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll get a headache sometimes, and I'm like, am I, am I still at risk? So it's just... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, 
aligned with what you're, what you're saying. What we haven't named in this space, or who we haven't named, is the midwives with intentionality. So integrating midwifery care um, in New York, a midwife can't lead a birth center. She can't. It, or they can't, because not all midwives identify as women. I'd stand corrected. Um, and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, so it's just not honored and respected. And the thing to align with what y'all two just said, there's a saying that we now have taken up is that postpartum is forever. I'm still impacted by the three babies I had. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> I'm still trying to find my mind from the three babies that I had. So, right, <laughs> for real. So postpartum is forever, y'all. Postpartum is forever. Um, and so I know we have a question right uh, in the back, but I would just want to say to what Dorian said about uh, the doula legislation, that was line item vetoed by the governor. So we don't have that policy. And so there is a call to action that when legislation is introduced, um, everybody in here can go to the state house and provide testimony. And so we have a question from the audience member. So until there is that policy that really helps dictate when we're looking at the healthcare system, I timely in the last week had you know heard a, a podcast, I think it was racism in healthcare that called, called out the root of a lot of this discrepancy in maternal health, but across the board and um, black individuals that are patients that, you know, they, they experience more pain or, you know, being able to um, be overlooked because of the, the thought of how pain is felt in different individuals of color versus none. And so with that, Jatu, um, if you could, do you have any, like, is there movement? Has there been anything that is versus you hiring, how you've been hiring to have those face-to-face -face and, and likeness in, in conversations. Is there anything that you're seeing in the healthcare system that is dictating it? As of right now, no, I'll be honest with you. I will tell you, when I was pregnant with my second, I was offered Tylenol while I was in full-blown labor. So, yeah, that was two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I wish that I had an answer for you. I really do, but it, it, I don't. Other than, other than like I just like I said earlier, standing guard for each other. We just the, the, no. I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> has introduced additional challenges to maternal health. How has the pandemic exacerbated existing disparities and what steps have been taken to provide adequate support to expectant black mothers during this time? No, it's fine. I think okay. I got it now. Go. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add very quickly, jumping back, to add to what it is that you said, um, because it is one of the reasons why I no longer work on the floor because of the stress levels that come from having to do that. And so one of the things that we're dedicated to as an organization is making sure that we can support, in particular, black practitioners that are working on the floor to be able to make sure that they're able to provide the care that they need to inside of the systems where they may be um, having challenges with being able to have that voice. And as far as the system change, it does have a great deal to do with having that external advocate because we will call in a minute and say, we need X, Y, and Z taken a look at because something has been overlooked. And make sure that we are addressing those very specific stereotypes and misnomers about us as black people because you don't get to make that judgment. It's not based upon any medical evidence whatsoever. And we will take the time to break it down for you while you're treating our patient actively in the hospital at that moment. Right. Regarding COVID and the pandemic, how was it negatively impacted? Um, COVID and the pandemic had a significant negative impact for reasons that most folks don't want to talk about. One of them was because it was an ultimate, ultimately an opportunity to be able to control the birthing space and care that was being given within the hospital because nobody knew what was going on. So it gave an opportunity to be able to lock down and make the policies and say that we were going to do exactly what we wanted to do, regardless of what the family wanted or needed. So it caused a significant separation. It actually caused um, significant medical, it caused the only um, the only fetal loss that we have ever had because of not being able to have a patient be able to go 
um, into the hospital and then have anyone admitted with her because her husband was working out of state. So we did see that there was an increase in that. We also saw that there was a significant increase in cesarean section. We saw a significant increase in inductions. Um, and all of that had to do with paranoia versus actual medical evidence, which created a lifetime and long-term issues. What we see from a physiological perspective is that there, were some, there are some issues that come up um, in regards to the pandemic and um, normal physiological development issues sometimes with infection, but not to the place of needing to separate mom and baby or family. And so when we take a look at this overall and when we start looking back at it, we're really going to see what those negative impacts were had a great deal to do with the rush to intervention versus actual study of what could be and what may not be. We also saw an increase in families who needed support with other life domain areas. So we saw an increase in families who needed food supports, transportation supports, diaper supports, uh, form, or all those other kind of supports that we ended up having to provide because other folks either couldn't in a timely fan manner or, or just didn't for whatever reason. And it was to Jessica's point earlier, we don't have a line item budget for those things. So we're taking money from, what, what's that adage, you Robin Peter to pay Paul or Robin Rashawn to pay Malik, that's what we were doing uh, in, in our organization. And, and that still has continued. I see we have a question from an audience member. Yes, thank you. Appreciate what you're doing here and bringing to the forefront what's going on, but I do have a question concerning fetal mortality. Uh, it seems as if either you're clumping in with infant mortality or it's not something being discussed because the numbers for fetal mortality is, are as alarming as infant and maternal, and the numbers for disparity are just as imbalanced. And so can you speak to the fact that there is a difference, Jatu, as far as fetal mortality uh, different than maternal or infant, because I think many people don't even understand the context. Uh, I didn't understand until our youngest daughter. Uh, by the way, she is a uh, anchor on NBC4, so at 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock every afternoon here in Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> did I do that right, Matt? Matt, did I do that right? Okay, just checking. Uh, but it, she, she is the one who had the stillbirth in October 2021. And I didn't know anything about infant, maternal, or fetal mortality until we went through this. And as a grandparent, the hardest thing, and as a man, the hardest thing to do was, how do I fix this for my little girl? And so uh, please speak to fetal mortality and bring that to the forefront, if you could, and just share uh, any thoughts that you have on that. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so we spoke before the forum started about um, how they are not aggregating the data to separate out fetal um, mortality. And um, to speak back to Dor Dorian's point at the very beginning of the forum about this not being new data, um, I sort of liken this whole, this whole topic to um, the era of cell phone cameras becoming real popular. And all of a sudden, we started seeing you know, black bodies being brutalized by law enforcement. And what were black um, communities saying? this is not new, this has been happening, this has been happening and now we're just seeing it, it's now just being televised. Same thing, somebody decided that we're now gonna start aggregating this data by race and everybody's jaw fell on the floor. But it's not new. Same thing with the fetal data, we just have to separate it out and start putting it on paper because we know that the disparities are out there, it's not new data, we just have to put it on paper and so I think that's what, that's what needs to happen. I'll say really quickly because um, my organization, the ARIA Foundation, and my company, Spirit of a Woman, very, work very closely with an organization called Push for Empower Pregnancy that deals with stillbirths. And there is also, just like maternal mortality and infant mortality, an issue around stillbirths disproportionately happening with um, black women and people of women of color or birthing people of color. And we absolutely have to pay attention to that. You know, folks being told that the pain they feel is in their head, or you're just an overzealous, paranoid mother, and you don't feel the baby moves, it's like, oh, don't pay attention to that, that's normal. Like, all of the misinformation. And then also what's a, a tragedy, Doug, I see you, I'm sorry, I see you wrapping us up. Um, <laughs> I'm watching you. Um, the other issue is, once the stillbirth happens, telling folks, we don't know what happened, it happens. I'm like, no, we want to know. So pushing for 
autopsies, some more information for the families, and being a stand that they know what happened because they carry that. So many birthing people blame themselves and are in such a state after carrying a baby to term or, or near that and then losing the baby. And then I, I speak to them all the time as a clinician, you know, and it's very, very painful. So we do need to study more. And I love your big ups for your, your baby girl. You better go, Dad. <laughs> Um, I have one minute before I pass it over to Matt, but I think this is where local government as a funder could um, be helpful in this space as we're funding, um, providing funding to Franklin County Public Health or to Columbus Public Health in um, disaggregating data. Um, we have a maternal mortality review board um, at the state that should be disaggregating data all the way to what you were talking about, the direct and indirect causes of deaths for women, um, infants, but also, um, you know, separating out fetal deaths. So everyone, I wish we had more time, because um, this is a, obviously a necessary discussion, and we could talk about uh, this all day and what we can do uh, from a systems change perspective. But I have to wrap up. Um, we, Doug didn't have to give it to me, because we were already, me and Shawnee both were looking at him. But I will turn it back over to CMC board member Matt Barnes for concluding remarks. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. I want to remind you all again to, to check out the, the flyer that's right there. On the, you can RCP to see Aftershock today at COSI. Um, this conversation, I'm sure, will become even more uh, important when you see the documentary. So uh, please, again, make sure you check that out. Uh, and if you can make it to COSI tonight, please do. Um, I, I know, like you, you probably found tonight's forum fairly sobering, but also it's an important discussion to have. Um, you know, as the Commissioner said, it's not so much a hidden epidemic, you're probably right. Um, it is something we are talking about more, but still not talking about enough. And thank you all so, so much for sharing your personal experiences. I could see the passion in each one of you. Uh, and just thank you for everything you're doing to help uh, fix this problem, because it, it has to end. Um, we do want to thank the sponsors of the CMC's Optimal Health Series, the Ohio State University Wexler Medical Center and Nationwide Children's Hospital. The sponsors of today's forum again, Cardinal Health, Mount Carmel Health System, and Ohio Health. To our partner, the Franklin County Board of Commissioners, and to the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for hosting us once again. And of course, grateful to all of our virtual C patrons and the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream. Once again, special appreciation to our speakers, Jatu Boykai, Shawnee Benton Gibson, Jessica Roach, Dorian Wingard, and our host, Commissioner Crawley. Big round of applause. Thank you for them. Again, please make sure you check out uh, the documentary tonight. And then make plans to attend next week's forum, The Hits Keep On Coming, Affirmative Action at the Crossroads. Woo, here we go. <laughs> Listen, it's a big discussion to have. Uh, also, please take a moment to answer a short survey about today's forum that you'll find on our website. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great Wednesday. Have a great rest of your week as well.